Okay, so the lab practical one is going to consist of 50 questions. And it will be timed to two minutes per question. So 50 questions, two minutes per, per, per question. As a matter of fact, yeah. Um, no, I have a time to more than that. I have time to two hours uh, because that will make it 100. Uh, it's 120 minutes. So it's, it's more than two minutes per question. And the reason why it's more than two minutes per question is 120 minutes is because some of the questions do require a little bit of time to look at data and uh, read the questions and figure out the answer. So it is uh, longer than two minutes per, per question. So it's not two minutes per question, it's 120 minutes, 50 questions, three bonus. Um, it will be opened tonight, 9 at uh, 10, 11, and it will be open until um, Saturday. So that will be 10, uh, 17. Okay. It is a pool. So it's a pool of, uh, I don't know how many questions, uh, about uh, uh, two, 300 questions, something like that. And the questions come from the lab report material. That means the lab reports themselves and uh, PowerPoints that were associated with the labs, with the lab reports. Okay. So the um, lab practical study guides go over the lab reports for the most part and review the answers to the lab reports. So the first lab, lab, lab that we did uh, encompassed uh, safety. So there will be a, a few questions about safety, uh, things like uh, you know, where to dispose of materials, um, the, um, what else? Oh, there isn't much actually that this is it. This is basically it right there, okay? A lot of it is just uh, the importance of PPEs, what is PPE, what are PPE equipments, why do we hand wash our hands, and important also, how do we dispose of materials? Okay, so there isn't much about that, but there will be a few questions on safety. The uh, next uh, lab report was on microscopy. Now, this one is a little bit more uh, involved. Uh, first of all, you should go over the, uh, the steps on using a microscope. Um, do we you know which objective do we start with? Uh, do we move the stage up or down as we're looking for through the oculars to find the specimen? Which knob do we use to find focus the specimen once we have found, found it? Uh, and then you know, how do we switch to the next magnification? Uh, and then after we find focus and we find the specimen, we do not touch the course adjustment knob anymore. Uh, you should know why our microscopes are called parfocal scopes, why are they called compound scopes. Uh, definitely know the parts of the microscope, the oculars, and remember that a compound scope is called compound because it has two sources of magnification. Okay. Uh, meaning that it has two sets of magnifying lenses that are going to um, enlarge the image, magnify the image. Which means that if you explain a compound scope as a scope that has more than one lens, that is not a correct answer because all scopes are going to have more than one lens, or at least most will, because most of them will have more than one objective lens. The difference is that in a compound scope, we have two magnifying lenses that at the same time are being used to magnify the image. So one of the magnifying lenses are going to come from the objective lenses. It will be one of the objectives. The other one is going to be the oculars. And the oculars magnify the image 10 times, the objectives magnify them different 
magnifications depending on which objective you have in place. So um, as you um, review the parts of the microscope, also review for yourselves the, the functions of those, of those uh, uh, structures. Um, so ocular objective lenses are, are the, uh, actually they are the first set of lenses that magnify the image. The second set will be the oculars. Uh, learn the different objectives that are found in the scopes that we typically use in microbiology. And I'll go over them here in just a second. Uh, the revolving nose piece is the little device that holds the objectives. The stage is the table-like uh, surface that we put our slide on. It has the little uh, clips that are going to hold the specimen. Underneath the stage, this little contraption down here is the condenser. And the work of the condenser is to condense light, meaning to gather light and to shoot that light through the uh, little hole in the uh, um, stage towards the specimen. The device within the condenser that controls the amount of light that is going to be shot to the specimen is this little lever here, which is the iris diaphragm lever. The um, uh, knobs that control the stage are the stage knobs right here. There will be another knob that is going to control the condenser, moving it up and down also. Uh, below the stage, below the condenser, uh, uh, mounted on the base of the scope is the light source. Um, and then on the arm of the, um, of the uh, microscope, there's going to be a couple of knobs, a big knob, which is called the coarse adjustment knob, which is the one that is used to find this specimen, because this is the one that moves the stage up and down in large increments. The smaller knob sitting inside the large coarse adjustment knob is the fine adjustment knob, which is used to focus or fine focus the specimen once it is found, because that one moves the stage up and down in tiny, tiny, tiny increments, whereas you don't even see it moving, but it is moving. Um, okay, I think those are all the parts here that we covered. So review the parts of the microscopes and the functions of the parts. Yeah, I'll go over the appropriate way to uh, leave the microscope, to store it, to care for the microscope, you know, clean it. Um, always leave the 4X objective, the smallest objective in place. Um, the stage should be all the way down. Uh, define resolution, okay, the, uh, the ability of a scope to resolve or to separate two structures that are close together so that they look like two structures as opposed to looking like one structure. In order to resolve an image, light sources, light rays, have to go in between the structures so that we can see them as two separate things. So we need a small wavelength of light. So we need to go back and review, um, review how can we improve the resolution of a microscope. All right, uh, compound scope, we have talked about that already. Uh, parafocal ability of the scope is the ability of, of the scope to stay in focus as we change objectives so that we don't have to refocus every single time, meaning we don't have to find the specimen again and try to find focus again. And that's why we say once you have found your specimen and find focus the specimen under a low magnification like 4x, you leave the course adjustment knob alone because the scope is parafocal, and at that point, all you need to do is switch objectives, and the image should still be there. Only thing that you may need to do is find focus a little bit. Um, review what is the field of view, um, which is the area that you see when you look through the oculars. Um, know that the field of view decreases, becomes smaller as the magnification increases. So we have a large area with the 4x, which becomes smaller with the 10x, even smaller with the uh, 40x, and even smaller with the 100x. Um, however, because the scopes are part central, the center of that field of view remains the same. So that's the reason why we always move the specimen to the middle, so that we don't lose it as the field of view decreases in area. 
Um, let's see, you know what a working distance is and know that working distance decreases as magnification increases. So that would be the distance between the objective, uh, let's say that's the 40 X, and the slide. So the higher the magnification, the longer the objective, the smaller the distance between objective and slide. So that's a small distance versus this is being a larger distance. Um, and yeah, a numerical aperture is the ability of the microscope to gather light and resolve the image. So the larger the numerical uh, aperture, the better the resolution because that means the more light is gathering, uh, is being gathered and therefore the better the resolution. Um, oil improves numerical aperture because it prevents light from being scattered. It oil allows more light to be gathered and shot into the objective. Um, so uh, this is one means to improve resolution is oil because it improves the numerical aperture. A paracentral scope means that, like I mentioned, the center of all the filters view is the same. And that's what we always center the specimen. So all these were uh, terms that had to be defined in lab report two. Um, total magnification, make sure you can calculate total magnification of a specimen. You multiply the magnification of the objective times the magnification of the ocular, and that gives you the total magnification. When it comes to the objectives, make sure that you know the magnification of the objective and the name of the objective. Okay. So that if a question asks what's the total magnification with the low power objective, you know that the low power is the 10x objective, which multiplied by the 10x magnification of the ocular gives you a total magnification of 100x. Okay. Uh, know what contrast is and how can contrast be improved. Um, also remember one of the things that was asked in the uh, lab report was which of these parameters that we, that we talked about could be improved by mechanical manipulation of the, um, of the microscope. And we can improve contrast with mechanical manipulation because we can increase or decrease light by opening or closing the iris diaphragm. We improve uh, magnification by changing objectives. Um, we cannot improve um, resolution by mechanical manipulation, because if um, the, the way to improve re uh, um, resolution is either with oil or with a smaller wavelength. So that's not a mechanical, that's not opening the light or closing the light or changing the objective lens or, or, uh, increase, or uh, bringing the stage up or down. So it has to be done with something outside, oil that has to be added. Um, a filter that we added in order to uh, improve resolution. Okay. All right, lab report three. And by the way, be free free to, to stop me and ask questions. Um, lab report three dealt with survey of microorganisms, and essentially this this uh, went over the different kinds of microorganisms and what did they look like under the microscope. So go back to the basics of how can you tell a prokaryotic cell versus a eukaryotic cell. So that given a, uh, a specimen, you should be able to say, oh, that is a eukaryotic cell, or no, that is a prokaryotic cell, and explain why. So with prokaryotic cells, obviously, you're not going to find a nucleus. And these are typically small uh, organisms that are looked at 400x magnification, or better yet, 1,000 explication. Whereas eukaryotic cells are larger, they can be seen at lower magnifications. Uh, anywhere from 40x to 400x are okay to see most of these organisms. Obviously, they are eukaryote. They are going to have a nucleus, and they're going to have a um, uh, things like uh, you might see a vacuole inside you may see the cell of oh, cilia flagella you may uh, yeah a uh, cell you may distinguish chloroplasts cell walls etc uh, notice these magnifications i have here are uh, not total magnifications 
The ones I gave here are total ramifications. So here would be the, the uh, uh, objectives that you, you would be using for eukaryotes, for example. Uh, then go back to each of the different types of microorganisms, the algae, you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, protozoans, the fungi, yeast, fungi mold, and then obviously bacteria. And looking at these organisms, the questions that you would expect is, first of all, is this a eukaryotic or a prokaryotic cell or organism? Um, and obviously, how can you tell? Explain your answer. Um, the other question would be, what type of microorganism is it? And again, explain your answer. So in the case of an algae, if we're looking at a unicellular algae, you'll be looking for, first of all, single cell organism, large enough to be a eukaryote. You may see a nucleus in there. Uh, you may see green chloroplasts uh, inside the cell. So that is the key or the giveaway that this is an algae. Um, oftentimes, algae, because they have the cell wall, they will have geometric shapes. Um, I don't have the algae, the multicellular algae, but the multicellular algae is incredibly easy because those are huge. You can definitely see the chloroplasts and they are multicellular. Uh, protozoans are single cell, all of them are. Uh, they lack a cell wall, so they don't have a geometric shape. You can see the free form of, a, of an amoeba. You can definitely see nucleus. Um, you may even see some vacuoles inside. Um, on a trichomonas, that's a protozoan, you can definitely see the nucleus. You can see the flagella. So this is obviously a pretty large organism. This is a paramecium, this is a ciliate. You can see the cilia. I know this is not a very good uh, picture, but you can see definitely a nucleus and you can see a little bit of a cilia there. So it is not just a matter of recognizing the organism, but explaining why do you think the organism is what you say it is. And that brings me to um, the uh, questions in the, in the lab practical. Don't expect all of them to be multiple choice questions because many of them are not. Uh, obviously, there will be multiple choice, matching, fill in the blanks, uh, short answers, do expect short answers, um, true and false also. Yeah, so multiple choice matching, uh, uh, multiple answers, um, true and false, short answers, and uh, fill in the blanks. Okay. Uh, mold, remember, I mean, fungi, we have two types of fungi, mold. Uh, on responders lockdown? Yes, it is definitely on responders lockdown. Yes, thank you. Yes, it will be on responders lockdown. Yep. Um, so remember mold, we have two types, but uh, I'm sorry, fungi, we have two types, fungi mold, fungi yeast, be able to tell them apart. Uh, fungi mold, again, th those are easy. You shouldn't miss those because those are the huge organisms, multicellular, now you see the hypha all over the place, the little strings called the hypha. Um, at the end of the hypha, there's typically some form of fruiting body that has the little uh, spores. So nothing else really looks like a fungi, like a mold, I should say. Um, yeast are a little bit trickier because those are not as, uh, they, they don't have as many structures. They are, they're simpler. Um, and they could be confused with protozoans. Uh, or even with a bacteria for that matter, except for the size, these guys are, are larger. So in the case of a yeast, you're going to be looking for a little cell with a nucleus. The other giveaway is the bud, a little bud in yeast. Uh, as a matter of fact, that is how it is identified under the microscope in a clinical lab, because they look like, otherwise they could be white blood cells. You know, they, they, they don't look like match and they just look like a little circular cell with a nucleus uh, however if you look if you find body in yeast that is the telltale sign that you're looking at a, at a, at a yeast because other cells don't body all right uh, bacteria their size is the giveaway they're tiny obviously they're not going to have a nucleus and so when it comes to these cells, you are going to need to uh, this, uh, determine the shape of the cell. So these ones that you see here, these are hopefully, obviously, they're going to be uh, broad shaped. Um, as far as the arrangement, 
you sometimes you will be asked to identify arrangement if that is the case that you have to identify arrangement um you will be um it will be an obvious arrangement okay uh, oftentimes arrangement is not as easy to see so i'll make sure that it's obvious especially because this is you know this is a, 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 this is not a uh, hands-on lab where you can actually look around on a slide and, and see everything that you can possibly gather of information from a slide so um now but the point i want to make about this though is read the question um if the question is asking for shape and arrangement then make sure you give shape and arrangement if the question is asking for shape only um don't bother with arrangement okay all right, um, you should be able to distinguish structures like nuclei or cilia. Obviously, this is in the case of eukaryotes, flagella, pseudopods, chloroplasts, hypha, fluting bodies, uh, cell membranes, and cell walls. Now, how can you tell the difference between a cell membrane and a cell wall? Well, you really can't. You cannot. Uh, but you can guess what it is by knowing the organism. So if you have a little cell that you know is a bacteria, then you know that that right there is going to be a cell wall. If you have a little cell that you know it's a protozoan, you know that that thing right there is a cell membrane because you should know protozoans don't have cell walls. Okay. Obviously, on something that has more of a geometric shape, that's the especially in things like fungi and um, algae, that's the telltale sign this is a cell wall. Cell walls in eukaryotes tend to be more of a geometric shape. Okay, so, all right, uh, next, um, let me see what I, okay, next, um, um, yeah, this is the same, this still the, in microscopy. Uh, will we have to identify mycoplasma? No, you would not have to identify mycoplasma. Um, we didn't really see mycoplasma on any of the exercises. So, yeah, no, no, no. Right, because that would be one that doesn't have a cell wall. And then that would be kind of tricky to say this is a cell wall when in reality it's a mycoplasma and it doesn't have a cell wall. So, yeah, no, you would not have to do that. Um, so we also well, went over how to view specimens under the microscope, how to prepare a slide, uh, obviously know what we mean by heat fixing, uh, why do we need to heat fix, um, know the advantages and disadvantages of viewing, of viewing a stained specimens. So the problem why we need to stain is because biological specimens are translucent. So uh, adding a stain allows us to, um, to introduce some color and being able to see better the specimen. Uh, okay, yeah, so it's just to add contrast. All right, uh, now this, the uh, steps in preparing a slide, you know, use a septic techniques, use clean slides, uh, heat fix. Okay, that's just going into a lot of detail there. Let me see. There we go, heat fixing. It kills and it sticks. Okay, so know exactly the reason why we want to heat fix. And what happens if we don't heat fix? Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, we got that already. Okay, so when we look at the specimen under oil, we always use the 100x. We don't want to use the 40x under oil because that is going to ruin the 40, 40x objective. And the 10 shape and, uh, and uh, arrangement of bacteria. Okay, and we are going to go into. Um, other uh, labs like the gram stain lab in which we'll look at the slides and we'll see okay what what is the gram reaction and arrangement and so we'll we'll go over those okay Let's see Just a second yeah no the difference between acid dyes and basic dyes okay we did that already also well we didn't but we're gonna go over these uh, remember that a basic dye is one that has a positive charge, therefore it's going to color the cells um, versus a negative charge, uh, uh, an acidic 
dye, which has negative charges and colors the background. Okay. All right. Any questions? So this is a this is a study guide A. Uh, let me open a study guide B. So lab practice one is study guide A. Let's see which one is this? Oh, this is B. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this is study guide B. Okay. Uh, let's see, yeah. septic techniques. Yeah, explain what's the purpose of septic techniques. And uh, we, we've had this question several times, is to avoid contamination or, or growth of unwanted organisms. Uh, growth medium is the substance that we use to grow microorganisms in the lab. Um, why are agar plates incubated upside down? That's to prevent contamination. Uh, know what is a colony. And the main thing when it comes to defining a colony is to say two things. This is going to be a cell, or sorry, a, a group of microorganisms that grew from one cell, or CFU. And the implication of these is that every single cell in the colony belongs to the same genus, a species, and a strain. The implication of that is that this is a pure culture. So those are the importances of what a colony is. So if asked to define a colony, make sure that you explain what a colony is. Um, OK, so this is identified growth temperature in degrees Celsius, body temperature. Yeah, so you, know, you should know what a body temperature is. That's 37 degrees centigrade. Okay, that's 37 centigrade. Room temperature is 25 degrees centigrade. Refrigerator temp temperature hovers between 4 and 6 degrees centigrade. So definitely those temperatures. Now, given the results of an experiment, you should be able to interpret the results. So in this virtual lab, what we did is we grew bacteria from different sources, from a banana, soda can, a keyboard, cash, hands before washing, hands after washing, lab bench before disinfection, lab bench after disinfection. And this is some results that they're giving you. Now, this may not be the same results you got on your virtual lab, so don't necessarily go by the virtual lab, go by the results that the, the uh, question is giving you. So in this case, they are giving you growth, and in, uh, one plus would indicate uh, let, uh, some growth, versus four plus, which indicates lots of growth. So in this case, the banana has very little growth, a uh, little variety. A soda can has a little bit more growth, but little variety. A keyboard has a three plus and little variety. Cash, on the other hand, has lots of growth, lots of variety, different types of colonies. So this is more of a mixed culture than the other objects. Um, now, look at the hands before washing and after washing. Before washing, lots of bacteria. After washing, less. But more importantly, lots of variety before hand washing, little variety after hand washing. And the implications of that was that hand washing removed the visitors. And what remained was just the normal flora. Uh, some similar, except that lab bench doesn't have a normal flora. Uh, after disinfection uh, or before disinfection, there is more variety than after disinfection. Okay. So, uh, know the difference between removing lots of different types of organisms and at the end having uh, less of a mixed culture. Okay. So, know the purpose of hand washing. Okay, which of the four objects had the most abundant? In this case, the, the cache had the most abundant. Uh, keyboard had also 
but the only difference was that the cache had more variety, keyboard had a little bit less uh, variety and less growth. Uh, the, the reason is because when we use a keyboard, we're typically just using our fingers. Uh, when we're dealing with cash, cash goes in the hand, cash goes on the floor, cash goes on a purse. I know it's thrown on the on the uh, you know on, a, uh, on top of, a, of a surfaces, etc. So it picks up bacteria from different environments. Where the keyboard is really only picking up bacteria from fingers. So that might be the, that could be explained as to the difference between the uh, variety of organisms between cash and keyboard. So there's a difference between bacterial load and bacterial uh, diversity growing on an object. I'm sure you can explain the difference between a pure culture and a contaminated culture, okay, or a mixed culture, I should say. It doesn't really have to be contaminated to be, no, if it's mixed, it, does, it may not necessarily be contaminated. It may be you know, purposely mixed. Um, explain the uses of aseptic techniques in obtaining a pure culture. A uh, given growth plate determine which is shown. Okay, so a pure culture is a population of cells derived from a single CFU. A mixed culture comes from more than one organism. Uh, and so the result is going to give you different sizes and colors of colonies. The uh, one of the probably best or only way to determine whether you have a pure culture or a, or a mixed culture is to grow organisms on a plate where you can see individual colonies. So this plate right here is hopefully, obviously, a mixed culture. You have two kinds of organisms there. The uh, uh, smaller uh, yellowish Micrococcus luteus, bigger, whiter uh, E. coli. This, on the other hand, is a pure culture, or it appears to be a pure culture. Um, there's only the little yellowish colony. Some of them may be a little bit bigger, but the color and consistency are pretty uh, Pretty much the same. Okay. Um, review the uh, aseptic technique steps. You know, what do you do first? What do you do second? Identify possible mistakes. Um, one of the things in the lab, the main thing I should say when I was grading these labs, is that remember that you try not to leave cultures open longer than necessary. And that is the reason why we order the steps in the way in the way we order them. Do not leave culture tubes or plates for that matter, it doesn't have to be a tube, opened longer than necessary. So for example, if you are going to inoculate or, or pick up bacteria better yet from a tube, um, you're going to heat the loop first. Then you're going to take the top of the tube and heat the top of the tube. And by then, the, the loop is cool enough to be able to pick up the bacteria. Then you again heat it first uh, before you close it. And then you can't worry about the next step. So the key is do not leave culture tubes open longer than necessary because that is going to risk contamination. Um, explain the purpose of wearing lab coats, gloves, when working with bacteria. Two things here. You're trying to protect two things. One, you're going to protect yourself. So protect um, from experimental bacteria. Number two, you're protecting the experiment from your, from, from your bacteria. So these are the two considerations and the two reasons why we're wearing protective equipment in a laboratory is because we're not only trying to protect ourselves, from potential opportunistic or, or pathogenic organisms that we're working with, but we're trying to protect our work from our bacteria. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And then we go into the staining itself um, and um, review all of the stains. Uh, capsule stains, no, the um, uh, no, the uh, I'm sorry, no, the uh, 
uh, reagents, the purpose behind the uh, capsule stain. Um, what is a capsule? What's the, what's the uh, work of a capsule? Uh, which stain stains the background? Which stain stains the cell? Remember, the capsule is itself will not be stained. Go back to the grand stain, review all the reagents, review the procedure, um, go back to all the things that could go wrong. <coughs> uh, definitely, we're going to have bacterial specimens, identify them as gram positive or gram negative, uh, shape, arrangement. Uh, remember to review why is it that a gram negative uh, is not the colorized versus a gram positive being, I'm sorry, what did I say? Okay, why is it that a gram positive is not the colorized versus a gram negative is the colorized? Um, and that is because of the, actually it's because of two things. There's two key things on the, on the uh, gram stain. <coughs> One of them is a short decolorization step. And the second one is, would be the thickness of the peptidoglycan. Maybe I should say three things. Let's say three things. And then um, the lipid outer membrane, if it is present or not. So in a gram-positive cell, the reason why a gram-positive cell is, is decolorized is because the decolorization step is short. It has a thick peptidoglycan uh, cell wall, and it doesn't have a lipid outer membrane. Because if the decolorization step is not short, the uh, gram-positive will be decolorized. So it is more than just a thick peptidoglycan. It could have a thick peptidoglycan, but if we don't, if we decolorize for too long, it doesn't matter that, that it has a thick peptidoglycan, it will be uh, decolorized. Okay. Um, by the same token, on the gram negative, the reason why the gram negative is decolorized is in, during a brief decolorization step is because it has a lipid outer membrane. And then on top of that, it has a thin peptidoglycan. So if it didn't have these two things, these two, you know, um, characteristics, the short decolorization step would not decolorize it. Okay. So don't forget, this is key right here, because if we do it, if we decolorize too for too fast or uh, for too long, we're not going to get good results. Um, okay. So review the problems with gram staining. And we're going to see some slides here in just a second. Uh, let's see, acid fast stain, same thing, review acid fast staining. The definitely know all the reagents, the purpose of the reagents, uh, be able to, um, to look at a slide and say, okay, this is a uh, uh, um, acid fast, non acid fast, and explain why. Uh, review some of the problems that we can have. Uh, what happens if you know, we don't decolorize well enough, or if, or if we don't add the carbofuchsia, if we don't add the counter stain, I definitely know the genus of bacteria that are acid fast. With the um, differential stain, I'm sorry, the uh, endospore stain, go back to the reagents that are used. Um, the purpose of an endospore, how do we force the stain into the endospore? Go back to the procedure. Uh, be able to identify endospores in a stain or not. So say this is an endospore former, this is not an endospore former. Um, yeah, explain the importance of the endospore stain. Make sure you can mention genera of bacteria that are endospore formers, and then identify problems with the endospore. 
I think that we I mentioned this before. Um, you will be told what the um, stain is because you could have a stain of red cells. And if you don't know what this stain is, first of all, you, you won't even know whether this is a differential stain or not. So, but if we say this is a gram stain, now you can say, oh, okay, so these are gram negative rods. But if we say this is an endospore stain, now you can see that you don't see any endospores. So you can say this is a negative for endospores. Or you can say microorganism is a non endospore former. So it doesn't make endospores as far as you can tell. Okay. So we'll tell you what the, what the stain is. All right. Um, so that's B. Before I move on, let me go ahead and let's go over some of these slides. Um, okay. Oh, that's not, I need to see what it's that I'm going to do. Give me a second. Oh, there you go. This one. Hmm. Uh, no, nope, this is not doing anything. Okay. All right, let me see if this did it. I should have done it. Come on. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. Okay. So um, hopefully this one on this side right here is fairly obvious that you have a gram negative rod and gram positive uh, cocci. Okay. Okay. All right, this one right here, uh, let's hope you can see these are all uh, uh, rods, and these are gram positive and gram negative rods. This one looks better, actually. All right, well, we have to identify mycoplasma. No, the arrangements could be cluttered. Oh, oh, I see, arrangement. Yeah, arrangement in the ones that we're looking at so far, uh, I would, the most I would say is clusters, arrangement. That's definitely not a, um, 
any uh, type of definitive arrangement. Yeah, let me show you a chain arrangement right here. Take a look at these guys. These are definite chains. Uh, these are gram positive. Okay, these are gram positive, and this is a, a, an actual specimen from a human uh, because you can see the white blood cells there. But um, you can see here gram positive rods in chains. I keep touching them with my pen. Okay, so that's gram positive rods in chains, all surrounded with white blood cells, but I know, forget the white blood cells. Uh, here's another gram positive. That's another gram positive. And now this is a bad slide in the sense that there's so many cells, it's a little bit hard to see, but these also look like they are chains uh, all around. Okay, so that is a, a chain gram positive. Just give me just a second. Um, I'm doing something here, give me just a second. Um, Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at something, see if I can find any more. Uh... Okay, give me just a second. I'll take a look at um I'm looking at uh oh this is a good one too. Let's take a look at this one. Uh this one is an important it's a, it's a I'm probably not gonna see this one in the uh and there's another one that's good next that I'm going to show you. Uh, you're not going to see this one in the test. However, this is an important one in the sense that this is a um, the top gram stain Wikipedia one. What would those arrangements be? OK, give me just a second. I'll take a look at that one in just a second. Uh, this one right here is a gram positive uh, rod in chains. And you can see the endospores inside that have not taken in the, uh, the crystal violet as well or at all because they're endospores. So this is what happens when you gram stain an endospore former. So it's kind of a uh, cool, I think. And, and yeah, uh, okay, the Wikipedia one on top. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure which one you're talking about. Let me go back. I thought gram stain couldn't stain. No, gram stain cannot stain endospores. However, uh, okay, I'll take a look at the top left. However, um, when you do a gram stain of an endospore former, even though you cannot stain the endospore, you can kind of guess that the presence of an endospore because you end up having this clearing in the middle of the cell, which is the endospore. But you can see how it hasn't been stained because the uh, crystal violet is not all the way through it. it, it you can see that, that clear stuff in the middle of the cell, which is the endospore. And it may have a little bit of a stain because th these endospores are inside cells, so they're not finished yet. So they don't have the, uh, the uh, tough coverings that it would have otherwise. All right, let me give a chance. And I'm gonna show you another one that I saw back down here. It's actually, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, that's what I want. Okay. Um, let me go down here really quick, and then I'll try to look at the one you're talk, talking about. This is a good one. Oh, there's more good ones down here. I'll probably put this one right here. Okay. A little slow. Okay, this one right here. Um, this one is a, um, give me a second, a, a, a palisade arrangement. These are obviously gram positive rods, and you can see how a lot of these cells are side by side to each other. And some of them have, you know, end up with, you know, strange looking shapes. So this is the palisade arrangement. So when you see that side by side, tons of cells side by side, there's your palisades. Uh, okay, so you said top left. I thought we had gone through the top left one. This one right here. 
Um, this is this if this is the one you were talking about, the Wikipedia one. It is a gram positive cocci and a gram negative rod. As far as arrangement, uh, arrangement in those. I would say clusters on both. The gram negative is a little bit trickier. There isn't enough there. I would, if this was a real stain or, or you know, a, 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 an actual slide, I would have to look more around because you do see some palisades. And when you see a little bit of you know, another chain here, I, I do see a lot of palisades, a lot of side by side. To where the gram negative, you could venture to say, is a, a, a palisade. The gram positive is, is clusters. Because when you have fewer of them, you don't really see anything bad clusters. There's a little bit of a chain right there. I don't know if you can, if I can make, I don't know, you can see my pointer. Anyway, there's a little bit of a chain, but when you have fewer of them, all you see is, is clusters. So this is really cluster as far as the, uh, as the gram positive is, is, uh, goes. Oh, this is a nice one. Okay, this right here. This is a really nice one because this is a little bit of a tricky one. All right. This is actually a gram positive cocci in chains. Um, you could argue some of these gram positive cells look a little bit like rods. Um, I would describe them more like ovoid. And that is true of some cocci, especially the ones that make chains oftentimes are not nice and round, but uh, no, Cocobacillus is a rod. This is, these, are, these are not Cocobacillus. A Cocobacillus is definitely a rod. Um, these are, and, and I can see how you would, you would think, okay, Cocobacillus. No, the, the, the problem is that the cocci that are in chains, capsule shaped, I guess you could say they were capsule shaped, but that's not a choice of shape capsules. Uh, the problem is the cocci that makes chains are oftentimes ovoid. They're either ovoid or they or they have kind of like um, uh, tips at the edges. Uh, ones like these is uh, they're, they're, they're cocci. And it is not necessarily you guys. Yes, I, I agree with you that this could be that, that, that you could call these uh, bacillus, a cocoa bacillus. However, um, when you read the description of the cocci that make chains, they're described as ovoid. When you look at them, they're oval. They're little ovals with pointed ends sometimes, uh, but they're gram positive cocci. Let's put it this way they're classified as gram positive cocci. Let's put it that way. Okay, so yes, you could argue one thing or another, but. When it boils down to it, they're classified as, 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 as gram positive cocci. Okay. Um, and that is typical of the, of the gram positive that makes chains. Um, the good thing about the rods is that most of the time the rods are obvious rods. That's the good thing about the rods. Now, the rods that are cocobacillus, those can be tricky. No question about it. Let me see if I can find. Um, just a second. So because of our limitations, when it comes to these kinds of questions, I would probably go for things that are obvious. I'm not going to. Oh, there's a nice, again, gram positive cocaine chains. Um, there's your bacillus. Uh, I'm not, I, I cannot give you a real slide that you can look around and, and, and make up your mind as to what something is. So because of our limitations, I will definitely be more um, lenient when it comes to, or I try to find really good slides in which, in which the answer is fairly obvious. This is the deal with the, with the uh, rods. Um, a lot of you answer when they were, we were trying to describe the shape of the bacteria in the capsule, a lot of you called it a cocci, which it wasn't. It was a rod. And actually, that it was a cocobacillus more than anything. But this is, this is the deal. Uh, when you take a look at a slide like this one right here, um, and we say this is pure, a pure culture. Okay, the fact that it's a pure culture 
tells you every single cell is going to be, have the same shape. So yes, you can see that some of these are tiny and some of them are obvious rods. If the, if the slide is of a pure culture and you see an obvious rod, it doesn't matter what the other ones look like. They're rods. Um, they may be they may look like a small rods because of the, sh the uh, position of the rod. If you, root at, if, you look at, if you take a pencil and you look at it straight on, it looks like a cockeye. If you look at it on its side, it's a rod. So it could be that this little cell is, is straight on and it looks like a, like, a, like a cockeye. So that's why if this is a pure culture and you see cells that are indisputable rods, just because some of them don't look like rods, you're not going to call them coca. You're going to call them rods, okay? Because you, you just need a few that look like rods for it to be rods. Um, okay, I mean, one of the tabs no, of the labs, it looked like the same bacteria were in short chains in some areas, but then in other areas, it looked like clusters. So were they made just clusters or chains? And in that case, will the answer be chains or cluster? Yeah, typically, if you see, if you see, yeah, okay. If you see a few short chains and mostly clusters, is clusters. When something is a chain, you're gonna see chains all over. So it's gonna be so many chains, like this one right here. Um, in this picture, you can look at the left hand side and you can say, oh, these are clusters. Oh, wait a minute, but no, you have you have other areas that you can obviously see chains, in which case this is chains. Okay. Um, so let me see if I can find more. Yeah, I don't know if you can see here that the one on the uh, right hand side is rods, the one on the uh, left hand side is cluster. Uh, is, sorry, cluster is is cocci. Uh, as far as uh, arrangement. I would say that they're both, you would probably call both clusters. The, the, the gram negative, you could probably call it also singles. There's a lot of single, 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 single in there. So I would probably go for singles on the gram negative and clusters on the gram positive. Uh, hopefully the gram positive is obviously chains. Uh, the little gram negative, uh, probably called singles. They're, they're, they're small gram negatives. I would probably just go for singles. Uh, maybe clusters, but uh, let me see if I can find the. Um, I want to see if we can. I can find uh, tetras. Um, give me a second. Surely they have tetras in here somewhere. Give me just a second. If not, I'll just Google tetras. Hmm. Okay, um, I'm going to go with Tetris. Nope. No, I don't see any Tetris. Uh, let me go ahead and Google. Oh, Tetris, uh, Silos, Syria, and I'm going to see if it will give me that. Any... Oh. Okay. I Google while well, Google. I, I wanted to look at this guy because this one is a Cocobacillus. There we go. This guy is a Cocobacillus. A Clipsian is a Cocobacillus. All right. So um, you can take a look at these cells. Some of them are tiny. Uh, but if you see several that are obvious rods, it's a rod. So that would be the key. Oh, tetras and packets. I don't know what packets are. Packets to me sound more like clusters. Tetras are the packages of four. So let me go ahead and Google the tetras real quick. And uh, I was hoping they would give me a uh, um, Positive interactors. Okay, I was hoping it would give me the the um. No, it's not giving me the, the option of the bacteria that's tetra, so that's okay. 
All right, let me hold the cards. Um, oh, there we go. Maybe. Yeah, oh, this is nice. This one is really nice. Okay, that's typical cards. Let me see if you can see it from where you're at. Yep, there we go. Um, no, yeah, I agree. Cocopacillus on the test. Yes, I, again, we have limitations. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's might have been realistic, not benevolent, but just realistic. Um, and it's not realistic. That's, that's the bottom line. Okay, it really isn't. Uh, we don't have the advantage of, of, of the real deal. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, take a look at this little... little uh, stain of, of, a, of a hopefully you can see the little packages of four little square packages and grant you some of them look like diplococci yeah they look diplococci maybe something happened to the other two um however I mean, sometimes i compare these to a uh, game of poker uh in that tetras trump diplos so in here if you see tetras and diplos you're going to go for the tetras because they're worth more if you will in the sense that there are more of them and it is more of a uh, significant arrangement. You can argue the, the, the little pairs of two either having divided again to make the tetrad, or maybe they lost the other two. God, God, no, probably they haven't divided yet because it, it, it requires several divisions before you get the actual tetrad um, arrangement. So that's that's why they look the way they do. But the minute you see these many tetrads, these, these guys are tetrads, period. That's, that's pretty, hopefully, pretty obvious. So, um, don't uh, overthink these. Again, I will definitely find stuff that is obvious. I'm trying to look for a spiral in there somewhere, which hopefully spirals are, are pretty, um, yeah, pretty self-evident too. Yeah, I can imagine. It is. This is a, a scary thing to think of. What is and and you can. And you can over guess things or, or you know, look beyond what it's there and try to. Yeah, I can see how this can be nerve wracking. Uh, so don't uh, it's, put your F other other places. How about that? Like calculating CFUs. We're going to those two. Uh, let's see. I was going to look at. Uh, what was I going to look at? Uh, spirals. Hopefully, it'll give me a spiral. Yeah, of course, it didn't. That's so silly. Okay, bacteria. How about bacterial spirals? Uh, there we go. Uh, too bad. Who can read your mind? Okay, let's see. That's not what I want. I want actual grand stains. Okay, how about that grand stain? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I know. It gets oh look at that. Okay, there's your nice spirals. I mean hopefully no you guys can can pick those up fairly quickly. So yeah. Okay, so hopefully I have put some of the fears to rest here so that we don't, uh, you know, uh, worry over something that perhaps doesn't really uh, need that much worry. Okay. So let's go to, let's go to the next thing, to the next uh, um Oh, broken ramen noodles. Yeah, they do look like ramen noodles. You are absolutely right. Yep, they look like ramen noodles. <laughs> That's a good way to describe them. Okay. Now, I am aware that I'm behind grading these lab reports, and I uh, am going to dedicate myself to them. Uh, I'm going to dedicate to this grading all day tomorrow, so hopefully I can get a little bit more caught up. Okay, so this is a study guide, whatever this is, C, they should, should be C. 
Um, all right, strip click method. Okay, so this is this will be lab, re lab report five. Uh, the purpose of the strict plate method, and, and really, I wish I would call it a strict plate method for isolation or something like that, or isolation is strict plate method. Uh, this is the method that we use to isolate, to create a, an isolate of bacteria. Uh, remember that we do four quadrants, uh, and uh, we only get one loop full of bacteria. And the reason why is because the idea is to spread and um, uh, dilute the number of organisms. If we keep getting more organisms, we're never going to spread and dilute. So we need to thin out. Okay. So that's the reason why we only get it once. Uh, what would happen if the loop is too hot? Well, we're going to kill the bacteria. What would happen if the bacteria culture is added to each quadrant? Then there's no separation. Well, we're defeating the whole purpose of thinning out the population. We're adding more population. So no, that's that's not a good idea if that, what you're trying to do is thin out. Um, what would happen if the loop was not flamed in between quadrants? Uh, same thing. No separation because you're not thinning out. You're just dragging more cells from one quadrant to another. So looking at these at these plates, you should identify bad or good or bad street plates. And probably the only one that's good is this one right here, from where I can see this. And the picture is not that great, but that one looks the best. Obviously, this one, there's not enough bacteria here. I mean, you cannot even see quadrants. It looks like you picked up, the student picked up organisms at every quadrant. And here, again, it doesn't look like there are many quadrants. It seems like it was not flamed at every quadrant. It just kept dragging more and more cells from one quadrant to the next. So it doesn't have the thin out uh, view. Uh, this one, it could have been that the loop was too hot and maybe kill bacteria as it was being dragged. Uh, this one is the best one. Now you can see the first quadrant, the second quadrant, third, and then you can see isolated colonies uh, here and there. So uh, know what happened. Know what a good colony look, a good strip plate for isolation looks like. Um, the purpose of the pool plate is to um, to count organisms to obtain isolated colonies, and from each of the cells in the plate, and so that's be able to count. So you could say purpose is isolate and counting uh, to calculate bacterial numbers. Identify the steps of making a serial dilution and pore plating in order. Okay, so um, you take the culture and you're going to transfer an aliquot of that culture onto a tube that already has diluent, a known volume. And from there, from tube one, you transfer a known volume onto tube two and then onto tube three. And you continue to make serial dilutions. Um, and then the plating is to take a small volume of the dilution and put it on a plate so as to obtain isolated colonies. Uh, in the case of pour plating, we're going to pour it on an empty plate. And then we're going to add the hot melted agar, as you say, melted and cool, not hot, cool, melted agar so that the cells will disperse inside and on top of the agar. So advantages of using oh, agar versus gelatin. Oh, OK, that's easy. Agar is um, um, it is a polysaccharide. It's a complex polysaccharide. So bacteria will not eat it. So microorganisms cannot eat it. We cannot break it down. I'm going to put E because it's shorter word and breaking down. Versus gelatin, which is a protein, and it can be eaten. So it can be eaten by bacteria. That's a huge disadvantage. Catabolized, exactly. That's a, a, a catabolic, yeah, it's correct. Broken down. Very good. Um, another one is at 37 degrees centigrade, which is incubation temperature, is it still solid. It remains solid at you know, 45 degrees centigrade. Is it still solid? You have to put it at maybe 55, 65 before it begins to melt. Whereas the gelatin, when you put back gelatin in your mouth at 37, it begins to melt. So it melts at 37. So you couldn't incubate things. And those are the two main uh, advantages. Is the boiling temperature for agar is higher boiling temperature, so it takes longer to, to dissolve. It can be incubated at higher temperatures. 
the gelatin melts quicker. All right, um, where are some of the colonies are small? Yeah, definitely know why in the poor plate, why are some of the colonies uh, tiny, where the others are big? Well, the ones that fell inside the agar are small because they don't have room to grow. The ones on the surface are bigger. They're the same organism, just the location dictates how big the colony can grow. Uh, what would happen if the plates are not allowed to solidify before putting it in the incubator? Well, hopefully you understand that the medium is all is liquid. If you put it upside down, it would all fall off. It would all spill. Uh, subculture bacteria. Uh, so when you're going to subculture a bacteria, you use an isolated colony because remember, a colony is a pure culture. If you begin taking bacteria from several uh, colonies, um, uh, they, uh, they, uh, you, end up, you risk a mixed culture. And the question was, does it affect the consistency? Yeah, and the answer is yes, the, the smoothness, that was the thing. Yes, it does. Does it affect the smoothness of the surface? It is not all the way cool, absolutely. Yes, and that happens a lot to students that they, uh, they think it has solidified, and is mostly solidified, but not completely solidified. They turn it upside down, and 24 hours later, when they look at it, it looks rough. It, it, you can tell that it kind of began to spill, but the surface had already solidified, so the, the middle was still liquid, and it, kind of, it has, a, it has a, a weird kind of like bumpy look to it, which makes it hard to, to see individual colonies. So yes. Uh, ideally, you know, you, you're supposed to wait until the entire plate. And it's to kind of an overkill. If you think it takes 10 minutes to, for it to solidify, you wait 15 minutes just to make 100% sure that it's been solidified. Um, okay, so the steps of making a pure culture is essentially get a, a, a single colony and transfer that colony onto a plate strict for isolation. And now you can see there's only one type of colony. Again, take one colony, put it in a broth, and now you have a pure culture. Uh, you could also go from here directly to the broth, uh, but that extra step is kind of like an extra assurance. So that will be a way to, to create pure cultures from mixed cultures. Um, again, aseptic techniques, the same questions appear a lot, and that's typically because these are important questions. Um, so if you want to obtain isolated colonies only, then you use the strict plate method. If you want to be able to obtain isolated colonies and count, you can use the poor plate or the spread plate method. Um, okay, quantify cancer bacteria, quantitative serial dilutions. All right, so this is talks about uh, diluting samples. So calculating dilution factors. Uh, and to calculate dilution factors, it's a ratio of volume of bacteria over total volume. And if there is a previous dilution, don't forget to multiply by the previous dilution. If there is one. Okay, so for example, one mil of bacteria in, into a 99 mil of water. Okay, so you have the little culture here. It's, once you get it, it's not that, you know, it kind of, it clicks. And unfortunately, I think that nurses need to learn dilution factors because oftentimes they need to dilute things. And I've heard of uh, serious mistakes that can be made if you don't know how to dilute things. So, okay, in this case, you have, uh, let me go back, 99 mils, already, okay, 99 mils water. Okay, so 99 mils water already there. That's the diluent. And you're going to add one mil of bacteria. Okay. So dilution factor, volume of microorganism, one mil. Total volume, one mil of the microorganism plus the water being 99 mils. And so this will be one to 100. 
That's a one to hundred dilution. Uh, okay. All right. One to, okay. And so one to hundred, you can express it, you know, one dot dot hundred. So that's one to a hundred, or one over hundred, or ten to the minus two, which is the same as the fraction one over hundred. Uh, okay. Let's go another example. One mil of bacteria culture. Okay, we got that one already. And then one mil. Oh, that's the same thing. Internet. Da, 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 da. Okay. So let's make another one. Give a four play procedure. Calculate CFUs. Okay. We'll, we'll do CFUs too. Okay. So let's go. Let's go for it. And we have that video that I made of uh, CFU problems. If that helps too. So let's go ahead and do something here real quick. All right, so this is the culture with the organism. And let's make three tubes. Three, and let's have different volumes. Oh, oh no. OK, so let's do this one, 0 0.9 mils water. Uh, let's make this one 90 mils water. How about that? And, and this is just for the sake of practicing these. And let's make this one 9 mils water. OK, so the transfer is going to be, so this is 3, 2, 1. So here we're going to transfer 0 0.1 mils. Here we're going to transfer 10 mils. Here we're going to transfer 1 mil. And notice that I strategically choose the volume to make easy dilutions to calculate, which is what you would do in the real life. You know, you're not going to give yourself numbers that are going to be, so dilution one, that are going to be hard to calculate. Uh, so you have 0 0.1 mils over 0 0.1, again, plus 0 0.9, which is the water. OK, mils should cancel. And now you get 0 0.1 over 1. Oh, no mil, sorry. OK, so the problem with this dilution factor is that it has that 0 0.1 in there, which is incorrect. I mean, I can go through turning these into a fraction and then solving a fraction divided by a fraction. But it is easy to just say, OK, well, let's get rid of the 0 0.1. The way to do that is to multiply numerator and denominator by um, by 10, and that will get rid of the 0 0.1. Uh, now, keep in mind what we're doing here. What it, this is saying is that the, the volume of bacteria that we added is a tenth of the total volume. That's, that's what this means. So if we multiply numerator and denominator by 10, we're going to be saying exactly the same thing. 10 times 0 0.1 is 1. 10 times 1 is 10. OK, so the bacteria was one part out of 10 parts, which is exactly what it said here. The bacteria was uh, one part out of 10 parts. So it was a tenth. This is a tenth. This is a tenth. OK, so this is the dilution factor for 1. Dilution factor for 2 uh, is going to be um, 10 mils over 10 mils plus 90 mils. And so mils cancel, and that will be 10 over 100, which is 1 to 10, yet again. OK. Um, but now we have to multiply by the previous dilution. So that makes it 1 over 100. And then dilution 3 is going to be 1 over 10, I'm sorry, 1 over 9, 1 plus 9, and I, mills cancel. So that's 1 over 10 times the previous one, which is 1 over 100. This will be 1 over 1,000. OK. Now let's uh, calculate CFUs. And um, let's say this one, the plate, I'm going out of room, and I really don't want to raise, otherwise I'm going to have to. Uh, we do everything. And let's say this plate gives us, um, I don't know, uh, 4,000 cells, which is too many to count. You would never count 4,000 cells. 
Uh, the next one, let's say, gives you about 380 cells. The next one gives you 25 cells, okay? Well, according to our range, this is the only one that's giving you a number that you can, they can work with. So that's the one you will do. Oh, and I forgot. Okay, so let's say now we should have, uh, well, let's say that you put a, a 0 0.1 mil volume into the plate, 0 0.1 mil volume into the plate, 0 0.1 mil volume into the plate. So you pretty much put the same volume into each one of those plates. Uh, the volume can change too, okay? So it doesn't have to be the same volume. The CFUs per mil, that would be number of colonies over the volume of the microorganism times dilution factor. So this, the uh, plate we're going to use is this one right here because that is the only one that gave us a good result or a result that is that is uh, uh, statistically significant or, or that can be counted. Uh, the other one is too few, the other one is too many. If you had more than one with good results, any of them would work, okay? So, um, CFUs per mil will be number of colonies, which is 380 CFUs over volume plated, which is 0 0.1 mils times dilution factor for number two, which was one to 100. Okay, now you just have to do the math. Uh, this is 1 to 10, this is 1 to 100, so 380 CFUs. Um, so 1 to 10 times 1 to 100 is 1 to 1,000. And so that will be 303.8 times 10 to the minus 3, except that we have this is not 380, I've converted into 3.8, so that will be two more places, so that will be 10 to the 5 CFUs per mil. So 3.8 times 10 to the 5, or what, 380,000 uh, per mil, organisms per mil. Okay. So, um, there will be more likely a, a problem like these that you either have to choose what the answer is or maybe it would be several you know questions and some of them would just be calculate the CFUs from this result or calculate dilution from this model or something like that so it would not be from beginning to end but there may be several questions in to watch one would just ask you for the dilution factor. Another question will ask you for the CFUs per mil given these results, okay? Um, and in this case, uh, again, because of we have limitations, this may be either a multiple choice question or uh, a fill in the blank question or a short answer question, knowing that there is the limitation of having to work with a, with a uh, a keyboard instead of a uh, instead of a, uh, a piece of paper. Okay, so we've gone A, B. We don't see. Did we do everything on C? I think we did. Did we? I thought we need to check over C again. I forgot if we did everything. We the appropriate method. We got oh, we just two. We got that, three, four. Oh, yeah, we stopped at here. Okay. All right. Um, uh, that should really say 3,300 and not 20. And all, okay, we got more examples of that. Okay, quantification using, using optical density. Uh, remember what is the spectrophotometer? What's a cuvette? That's the little, device, the little test tube that we use in the spectrophotometer. Oh, remember that the spectrophotometer only counts oh, counts dead and live bacteria versus the dilutions methods, which only give you live bacteria. So in that regard, that is a drawback of the spectrophotometer. <clears throat> it's, not, it's giving you a little bit of higher number than it would otherwise. So if you take a look at these, you have the, the results, growth results at every few couple of hours intervals of three different organisms. And you can see here 
how uh let's see. okay let's go first one by one uh the organism is growing pretty slowly at first it's not like me right for some reason so for the uh, staph aureus it's going pretty slowly uh, so between here and here that's a doubling in numbers because you have a doubling of the od and that took one, two, three, four, four hours to the only numbers. So that would be generation time of four hours. And then all of a sudden, within two hours, it began doubling numbers. So you can see how this is a little bit of a lag phase and it slowly begins to take get out of the lag phase. So this is more of a like that. This slowly begins to get out of the lag phase. Um, this is another doubling in numbers right there, another two hours. So this right here is definitely a log a logarithmic phase of a generation time of two hours. And that's where we stop. We don't see a stationary phase. And the E. coli, very quickly, within a matter of two hours, it goes from a very small OD to a really high OD. I mean, this is uh, 100 times more, 10 times more. Yeah, 10 times more than the previous one, more than 10 times more than the previous one. So very quickly. So this is more of a steep very short lag phase and a very steep climb all of a sudden. Uh, between here and here, there is your doubling in numbers. So that took, uh, what, uh, one, two, three, four, six hours for that doubling. Uh, but right here, the lag phase was incredibly short. And then very quickly, it went into a log phase, uh, which is stabilized. So this is giving you the um, uh, the uh, stationary phase. So right here is a stationary phase for um, E. coli. Uh, Friendly again went very quickly, and actually the doubling time all of a sudden this is incredibly steep. There's a doubling time right there. Then it slows down a little bit. That would be more or less the next doubling. Time. So uh, very short um, stationary phase and very steep all of a sudden log phase and it does give you a stationary phase between these two between zero point actually between 614 696 744 that is really a stationary phase right there so when you were to plot these you should be able to look at the plots first of all review lag log stationary and death phase uh, keep in mind because we're not we're measuring dead bacteria and live bacteria with the with the absorbance, we never get to a death phase because we're counting the dead ones. So we get to a stationary phase, but you're never going to see a decline because you always count dead and live. So you're never going to see the dead phase. Um, okay, because the spec only counts counts both that let that dead and live bacteria. Um, you can see here one of them was the stuff or okay that's you okay so these two are the uh, E. coli and the uh, Cytobacter frondi. This is the staph, which had more of a stationary phase. You can see here the uh, the uh, especially on the uh, uh, the uh, stationary phase actually on both. Uh, you can see how it goes very quickly, and then it kind of begins to die down. So in order to see the log phase, we would have had to read at closer time intervals to get more points in that in that area. So be able to interpret a graph if you're given a graph of these growth phases. Okay, uh, know how to distinguish food plates versus the spread plates, and advantages and disadvantages of each method. So go back to that one more time. And main disadvantage of the poor plate is that we're dealing with a warm agar, which may kill some organisms. Okay. Any questions over these? We have one more to go through. Maybe. One, two, three, four. Oh, okay, I guess I didn't. All right, let me try one more time. I guess I didn't um, download. Okay, this, this, this shouldn't take long. Uh, 
what about the spread blade? Correct, the spread blade doesn't use warm agar. However, the spread blade gives you only the surface of the media to work with. So typically what happens with the spread plates is that you have to dilute more. So if this is a pour plate, this is a spread, um, the spread only allows you to the spread the bacteria on the surface of the agar versus the pour, which gives you the surface of the agar plus, and it gives you volume plus the inside of the agar. So with the pour plate, you may get away with getting a good plate with a tent one in a thousand dilution, and that may give you a good plate. Whereas the spread, you're going to have to dilute more. So this may say it might be a ten to in a hundred thousand dilution to be able to have few enough bacteria to just spread them on the, on the surface. So it gives you less area to work with. That's the, the, the drawback of the spread. The advantage of the spread is that you can pick up the bacteria easily. They're all on the surface. Here, some of them are going to be inside the agar. There's no way you can get to them. Okay, so a drawback of the poor play. On top of that, on the poor, you're using the, the hot melted agar, which may kill some bacteria. Um, the last of the lab reports is lab report six, which goes over the requirements for growth. And so here, uh, go back to oxygen requirements. We use a, a fluid thioglycolate medium for in the in the uh, virtual lab. Remember the uh, indicator on the fluid thioglycolate. With the soft hour, we didn't do it, but we talked about it. It's just a matter of inoculating a melted and cooled tube of soft agar. The principle is the same, is to create this gradient of oxygen with lots of oxygen on the top and no oxygen at the bottom and progressively less oxygen as you move to, from top to bottom so that you have to look at where the organism is growing to, um, to determine the oxygen requirement. The key ones, the, the hard ones, will be facultatives, anaerobes versus aerotolerant. And for those, you look at the top. So in a facultative anaerobe, the top is going to have tons of growth and then diminishes the growth as you go down. Aerotolerant, typically aerotolerant, what it gives you is poor growth throughout with little growth on top, if any. So. Um, I don't know if you can see these. In this case, uh, number one is supposed to be an aerotolerant. This right here, you can see how it's, you can see the green of the rack on the other side. There's no growth right here on top, and you don't see growth until you go below that very top. This is a strict arrow. Um, this one is a facultative. A facultative also growing all over. And then uh, five is another strict aerobe, just on the top. Okay. Uh, what we don't see here is a strict anaerobe. That's the only one I don't see in here. Okay. Now you have here. This is the cloudy place. This is clear, so no growth. This one is cloudy, so this is growth. Uh, in in this picture that I'm working with right now, there is no air tolerant. The one up here, the aerotolerant is number one. Yeah, that then there and, and in the virtual lab they really didn't talk about aerotolerance. They just talked about the uh, strict aerobes, the strict anaerobes, and facultatives. Um, this one you can see clearing here. Maybe you can go a little bit higher than that, and then um, the uh, growth. So this will be a strict aerobe, and then here you don't see any clearing. Pretty much growth throughout. Okay, so that's facultative. Okay, anaerobic jar, uh, that's the one that has the packet that creates the, uh, releases the hydrogen that binds to the water. Yes, the carbon dioxide was there to take the place of the oxygen and prevent the creation of a vacuum. So if you don't put something, if you take something away and without putting something to replace it, you're going to create a vacuum. And there is no way to have, yeah, well, it's okay. It's, it's you know, um, 
there's no way to open that, that thing back up again because there's more air outside, which is pressing on that lid. There's no way you're going to open it. So uh, that's why. Um, Macrophiles, uh, we didn't really see any. Uh, those would be the ones that would have growth only in the middle and you would see clear and below and above and below. So not as far as identifying how they grow in a tube. Um, you should know they exist. You should know that they have catalases and, and SODs, but that's you know, basically all. Uh, the indicator for oxygen was methylene blue. And you know, as far as the, the, these jars, the only thing you can distinguish in these jars will be the uh, strict error of a strict anaerobe and facultative. Um, an aerotolerant tolerant would be difficult to distinguish because they would be, it would look like a facultative. It would grow across the board. The only difference is that it may not grow as well, but it would grow anyway. So those will be difficult, and that's why they don't even give you an aerotolerant tolerant in here. So it's just, uh, so be able to interpret. Given results like these, be able to interpret. Now, um, one more thing, and let me go back to, I'll come back to these and explain one more thing here in just a second. Okay, let's see. So temperature, again, growing organisms at different temperatures and interpreting their results. Uh, be able to determine what's the lowest temperature, what's the highest temperature, what would be the, the, uh, the best temperature. So here you have uh, lowest temperature, you would say 25 degrees, highest temperature 55 degrees, optimum temperature 38 degrees centigrade. So this would be the OT according to these results. Okay. Because so that's the highest OD. So you would say this organism is probably a mesophile since it grows at about 37, 38 degrees centigrade. Um, here you have lowest temperature 5 degrees, highest temperature 38 degrees, uh, best temperature 25, which makes it a um, cyclotroph because it's growing at a room temperature bed, best. Okay. Um, so if you want to stop the growth, you should place it at a high temperature, especially if you want to kill it. If you just want to slow it down, put it at a low temperature. You're not going to kill it, you're just going to slow it down. Um, review the temperatures at which these organisms grow. Know that all pathogens and opportunistic pathogens are mesophiles, because those are the ones that will grow at a... Um, um, at a uh, body temperature. Temperatures of organisms, I had a hard time on this lab because my organisms seem to be a mesophile. Okay, wait a second, I couldn't finish reading. Um, but its optimum growth temperature was 25 degrees Celsius, it threw me off. If the optimum growth is 25, it should be a cyclotroph, it should not be a mesophile. So if, if it's optimal, uh, if, it, if, uh, if you were measuring optical density and the best optical density was at 25, then it's, it's a cyclotron. It's not a, it's not a mesophile. Uh, even if it grows at 37, if the optimum temperature is room temperature, is a, is, is a cyclotron. Because mesophiles, but they grew at a much higher temperature. Oh, so it could grow. So what you're saying is that it, let's say, it grew from 10 degrees centigrade all the way to 45 degrees centigrade with the optimum temperature at 25 degrees centigrade. Is that what you're saying? Okay, this is the key. That's the key right there. If the OD was its best at 25, it's a cyclotroph. Uh, and I know it says that cyclotrophs are not supposed to grow that high. Yeah. I can tell you in our lab when we do these in real deal, they do all kinds of things. So you can have a strength of, yeah. Right, the, the, the ranges are averages. So the, the ranges are average in the real world, they're gonna do things that are not in the books, um, but the key is the optimal temperature. That's typically the key. If the organism grows best at at room temperature, then it's a mesophile. If it grows best at 37, I'm sorry, room temperature is a cyclotroph, sorry. If it grows best at 37 degrees, it's a mesophile. 
And it could be a mesophile and grow as high as 55 or as low as 5, even though it says that it shouldn't. Uh, we've seen that all the time. So um, it all depends. On the, the, those, those ranges are averages. Okay. So keep that in mind. Intergraph of absorbance versus temperature, thermal growth, maximum growth, description of temperature, okay. Let me see that. The optimum temperature is always towards the top of the range. Yes, it is. So if you had an organism, and I don't know the one that you had, how low it grew, but if it grew at 10, uh, 25, and then went as high as 45, um, that means, I mean, that's 20 degrees there. I mean, this would not be typical, except, except, okay, except one thing here, though. Uh, this is just 10 degrees. However, was it tested at 5 degrees? Uh, because if it was, okay, and it was no growth, then okay, yeah, this is definitely weird. But if it wasn't tested, then you don't know whether it would have grown at 5. Okay, maybe it did. Uh, so you don't know how low it was able to go. So I don't know. I would have to take a look at the results and see exactly what, what went wrong. Um, but even at that, I mean, I have this, this thing right here, and... I mean, this doesn't look very, well, what is this? I am trying to look at this. This is 20 something. This is 40 something. I guess that's 38. I don't know. I have a hard time reading that. Um, well, we have to see what the results are too. So you know, I will go by the results. So in this case, that, that this right here would be the optimum temperature. This would be the maximum, which looks like it's past 42. Minimum is about 25. So again, this is not your typical curve, but that's, I guess that's what I got whenever I did the exercise. So yeah, sometimes you get, you get extreme stuff. Um, but the key thing is highest temperature will be the optimum temperature. Okay. All right. So yeah, go, I, I, would, I would go by the peak more than the range. When it comes to classifying, go by the peak. Uh, you can't go wrong with the peak. Peak, whereas the range, yeah, range sometimes are all over the place. So yeah, that's that's a good rule of thumb. Uh, pH is probably easier because that's pretty straightforward. Most organisms like hover around a seven pH, a pH of seven. Uh, neutrophiles. Osmotic pressure, that's the one that was a little bit more of a uh, uh, tricky because you have the uh, halo tolerance versus the halo files. So be able to distinguish between them. So uh, Salmonella tifumurium uh, grew at 1%. So this will be, we decided this 1% was the equivalent of a 0.85. So this is the, 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 the normal growth, if you will. And it doesn't grow past that. So it's definitely not a halo tolerant. Staphylococcus epidermidis grew as high as 10 degree, 10 uh, so, percent of sodium chloride, not anything no, much higher, so it is a halo tolerant. Compare that with uh, halobacter uh, denitrificans. Um, I'll take a look at where you're, oh, in the pH lab. You have 0 0.2 at 3. Okay, let me take a look at that in just a second. And this one is obviously a halophile, it doesn't grow at anything unless it's higher than 25 or higher, I should say. Okay, so the pH, what you're saying is, let me go back to the pH, is that you had a 0 0.2 at 3, then you had 0 0.4 at 5, uh, and 7. Okay. And 0 0.4, and then 0 0.4, and then I assume 0, 0 after that. Okay, so um, yeah, I can see how that would say, okay, what is this? A neutrophile, I mean, a acetophile or a, or a neutrophile? Um, I think I would call this a neutrophile because of this right there. And most neutrophiles, not most, some neutrophiles can definitely tolerate lower pHs, like fungi. Fungi can go you know, five. Actually, fun fungi can go five very easily. 
0 0.25, 0 0.47, and 9. Oh, 9 too. Ooh, okay. That's, I must admit, that's a strange result. 0 and 11. Okay, good. I'm glad that was 0 and 11. Uh, yeah, I think the range of neutrophiles that I've seen is 5.5 .5 to 8.5. That's the range that I've seen. Um, so, yeah, I, I must admit this is a bit bigger range than, than you typically see for a neutrophile. Actually, probably 8, more than 8.5. Um, but does that mean there was no growth at all or death? Um, that's a good point, actually. That is a very good point that you're making. Oh. Yeah, that's the problem with OD. The problem with OD is that you don't know whether, you know, whether, yeah, you might be looking at 0 0.4, but what if they're all dead? Um, however, having said that, okay, this is the deal. And, uh, um, you should have a control, I guess. The, the deal is that it must, it obviously grew during incubation. Otherwise, it wouldn't have given you that 0 0.4. So if, I so if the initial, at time 0, I know what you're saying now. If at time 0, when you initially inoculated that organism, the OD was, let's say, I don't know, what would it have been? It would have been maybe 0 0.01. It went from 0 0.01 to 0 0.4 at pH 5. It grew. Even if they're all dead, it doesn't matter. It grew. It grew at pH 5. So, um, okay, I'll go into that question in just a second. So, no, these are valid numbers as far as the exercise. There was growth. There was growth at, at pH 5. There was growth at pH 7. There was growth at pH 9. A lot of growth. Uh, why? I don't know what to tell you. Uh, why would I call this organism? I would still call it a neutrophile because it grows at pH 7. That's why I would call it a neutrophile. And to go further, you would really have to do poor plates and see how many bacteria are alive and all that. I would still call it a neutrophile. Uh, neutrophiles can have a wide range. Um, again, uh, yeah, there are organisms like fungi, which is what the question, next question is. There was a question in this lab about what type of plate we would use to grow something. I forget the exact question. Some of us were confused about what you were wanting there. Do you know what I'm referring to? Okay. Yeah, let me take a look at the question. My guess, oh, I know what it is. Um, I know, I know what it is. Uh, I think it is the, um, oh, yes, STPMARIN versus S epidermidis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right here. It has to do with this. Actually, that's an important question, and so I'm going to come back next uh for the next lab practical, because we do this all the time. The question is, what kind of plate would you use to grow or to separate Staphylococcus epidermides from Salmonella typhoidea? These two right here. Okay, if you use a 1% sodium chloride, they both grow. You can separate them. You could you could use 6 6.5. You could use 6.5. And hopefully the question asks how to separate epidermides from 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 tithymerium. So if you have them growing both together and you want to get the staph epidermides out, separated from the other one, grow them at 6.5% sodium chloride. This guy dies, cannot grow. The other one grows, is out. So yes, I mean we can even go as high as 10%. 6.5 is fine. Yes, so what, what, which of the agars, yes, what would be the, the agar that you use to, to separate those two? Yes, the characteristics of the agar used to, to, to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is what we call a differential, or a, this is what we call a selective medium. And we're going to see that after the, on, on some of the next lab practical lab, lab, virtual labs, is that we use selective media to select for the growth, some, the growth of some organisms and stop the growth of others so as to separate them. So we use the characteristics of the organisms to grow them and separate them from others. So it's a medically important genus. Um, keep in mind, none of these organisms grow by themselves. Even in, in a, during an infection, you may have 
many organisms growing together and you want to get out the one that's causing the infection. So you can do that by using selective medium. So there is, if you want to separate S. epidermis from a mixed culture of epidermis and S. cimmerium, what type of agar plate would you use? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. No, that's okay. So yeah, and I think we actually mentioned these during the lab when we talked about lab report six. I think we did mention it. I could be wrong, but I thought we did. Um, but this is a segue. Um, will we be doing any hemolytic plates in virtual labs in the future? Yes, we do those in uh, unknowns, medical unknowns. We do hemolytic plates. And so we will explain about hemolytic plates, you know, blood agar plates and the bacteria eating up the red blood cells and all that. Yeah, we'll do those. Yeah, that's medically, it's very important, the, the, the hemolytic plates. Yeah. And you know, again, if this was a, an actual lab, we do it, we used to do it in um, throat cultures because oftentimes, you know, well, everybody has hemolytic bacteria in their throats. So yeah, it is cool. Yeah, some bacteria can eat up red blood cells and completely clear a blood plate which as you can imagine, that would be bad if you had that bacteria in your blood. Um, so it's strep throat, the bacteria that causes strep throat is one of those that can do that. All right, so, okay, environmental factors. Okay, so know the characteristics of most pathogens or um, of a, uh, uh, what, uh, um, uh, opportunistic pathogens or pathogens. The other thing is which environment can be used to inhibit microbial growth. You could use salt. You could use a refrigerator. What if you want to kill them? High temperatures, extreme pHs. OK, and then looking at these organisms that we've been uh, using, which will be the environmental preferences of them, okay, which most of those are pretty opportunistic pathogens, actually. So um, the other thing I wanted to point out really quick and we may have a question like that in this lab practical, like the one I'm about to explain. So put it in an environment outside of its preferred range. Exactly. Yes. Give it something that that exactly outside of its its preference. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. That's that's basically what you want to do if you want to slow down the growth or kill it. One thing that we do. Uh, maybe a little bit in this lab practical, but we'll do it more on the next lab practical, is we may give you results that make no sense. And you need to be able to pick that up. So for example, what if the result here was like these? So at 25 degrees, it's a little bit of growth, no growth at 38, and then all of a sudden, there is growth at 42 and growth at 55. Does that make sense? And you should pick that up as no, it makes no sense. No, of course it doesn't make sense. You know, you mean it all of a sudden it doesn't grow at 37 and then grows again at 42? That makes no sense. So you should look at these and say, well, yeah, that's definitely not correct. So this is not a valid uh, result. And then the next question could be, what could have gone wrong? Okay, so what happened here that there was no no growth? And it could be maybe the loop was too hot when you picked up the bacteria. Uh, maybe it was the, the temperature incubator was off. Um, so that could be two possibilities right there. So um, if you're given a result that doesn't make sense, you should catch it as, oh, that doesn't make sense. Okay. And it will be obvious, like this one right here, like the one I just mentioned. Um, okay. Any questions? Uh, would there always be a curve? Uh, that depends on uh, the result of growth. Um, yes, not always. So sometimes, uh, let's see, um, let's put it this way. If there was a curve for the virtual lab, then there may be a curve in the question. If there was no curve in the virtual lab, there will not be a curve question. So go back and review the curves that you got for the virtual labs. Does that make sense? So you could have results that are only 
Yeah, you could also have results that are only charts, like this one right here, no curve. Um, you could have these right here as the results that you have to interpret, um, or you could have these plus the curve. So sometimes this, some of the questions may be the table and the curve, or maybe just the table. Okay. But again, we stick to what we got on our virtual labs. If there was no curve in a, in a, in a, in a virtual lab exercise, then don't expect a curve on, on the question, on the test question. Okay. But there will always be nothing, something, nothing. Oh, you're talking about. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by nothing, something, nothing, as far as growth for bacteria. Yeah, like um, for like um, on the page that you have right now, there will always be, you know, like uh, there won't be a, a a like nothing right in the middle at 38 degrees. There will always be. Got it. Nothing. Okay. Right. I see what you're saying. If yeah, okay, that's exactly what I was talking about. If if you find a question in which it gives you a result that doesn't make sense and the question is interpret these results your interpretation should be it doesn't make sense this could not happen this must there was obviously a mistake made no so but like that yeah that's what i was asking like that that's always going to never make sense if it grows if it grows at 25 and it grows at 42 it's not growing at 38 that's what i mean when i say like Nothing, something, nothing. Like that is us. Yes. Yeah. There, there should, there should be something at thirty-eight. Correct. There should always be something at uh, Yes, absolutely. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, and and we'll we'll have we'll actually have uh, that as part of the lab reports on the next on the next labs. You know, kind of give you results that make no sense and you should be able to catch oh that makes no sense so in this lab practical there may be one question like that and but and it would be pretty obvious that yeah this makes no sense and you can say oh yeah yeah this makes absolutely no sense it shouldn't have happened this way okay so yeah um yeah no problem you're welcome so somebody wants to know the what is our class schedule for this week all right so um we are Good question. Uh, we're not going to have a lab meeting on Monday because we don't need one. Can we go? I'm sorry, you got cut off. Um, okay, so can, can we go? Because it's, this is a duty of a of a unit, and I think like it would help. I feel for like, lab? Uh, for well, if we if we use the lab session for Ooh, the lecture. Yeah, the lecture. yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we can do that. Absolutely. Because now we have to seven. Yeah, let's do that. Absolutely. Let's, so, so that will be a, a, a session on Monday and a session on Thursday. So we can start module chapter seven on Monday. And then on Thursday, we'll finish seven and start eight. Eight is actually uh, easier. Seven should be review from biology 14 to six. But eight is, I think, shorter than seven. So we may or may not be able to finish it all this week. Hopefully we can. But we may, you actually, I've, I've done eight in one sitting before. So we may be able to finish it all in one week. So yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for bringing it up. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'll send that an email. 8.30? Uh, yes, 8.30. Yeah, because I have a meeting at 7. So it has to be at 8.30. So yeah, let's do it at 8.30 Monday. And then uh, whatever it is that we have on Thursday, I can remember now. Okay, good deal. I'll send out an email to remind everybody. Very good. Anything else? So if anything else comes up, we can discuss it on Monday too. Okay, you're very welcome. Uh, you guys have a good night, and we'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow night. All right, good night.